Welcome to this afternoon's panel on data material collage and photomontage. Our second speaker is Ellen um, Sullivan Mains. Uh, she is an assistant curator at the uh, Rifkin Center for German Expressionist Studies at Los Angeles County Museum of Art, where she manages the Rifkin Center collection of single sheet prints, portfolios, posters, periodicals, books, and other works on paper. She is currently working on projects involving the connection between the Mexican print workshop, the Taller de Grafica, popular and German political graphics, the material culture of Germany's decade of inflation and expressionism, and Asia. Her research interests also <coughs> include the material histories of print, media, and technologies of prints, particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries. I want to thank um, Laura and the other organizers for this event. It's been a really great um, opportunity to see all these, uh, meet all these people and um, have conversations and um, about paper, which is always exciting. So thank you. Um, okay. So. By the first decades of the 20th century, paper of all kinds, colors, sizes, textures, and types was inescapable. The graphic designer Jan Shishold characterized this state as a paper universe, a place in which one was constantly beset by printed paper in public and private, requiring one to assess daily what to toss and what to keep. Modern man, he wrote, quote, receives a vast quantity of printed material on a daily basis that, requested or otherwise, is de delivered to him at home or encountered outside in posters, shop windows, lighted advertisements, and elsewhere. The new age of, this new age of print production differentiates itself from the earlier period less through its form and quality than through its quantity, end quote. Paper was an especially pervasive material presence in Germany during the First World War. An industrial powerhouse by the turn of the 20th century, Germany was nevertheless lacking many raw materials it needed to manufacture necessities. When the war began, a combination of an allied blockade and military requisitioning made many of these materials scarce and forced Germans to rely on goods that could be obtained domestically. Drives requesting a, the donation of a diverse array of stuffs, including various metals, fruit pits for oil, and even human hair were staged during the war. Paper was similarly affected by these material shortages. Manufacturers experimented with alternative fibers and sizing and encouraged recycling to prevent supply bottlenecks. But paper was a fundamentally flexible product, and wartime also offered opportunities for manufacturers to expand the range of paper goods and their possible uses. The Berlin-based Papier Zeitung, a trade journal for paper fabricators, manufacturers, and distributors, reported on developments in the paper industry and on novel uses for paper in connection with the war. It reported, for instance, that nurses were dressing wounds with paper bandages made from blotting paper, that paper socks and slippers were being made for soldiers in military hospitals, and that backpacks made from paper fabric were being tested in the field. The Papier Zeitung also reported on an exhibition in Vienna titled Paper as Protection from Cold and as Ersatz Material, which offered instructions on the ways soldiers at the front could weatherproof their clothing with paper, stuffing it into uniforms as an added layer of insulation. The publication offered other helpful do-it-yourself tips advising soldiers to use sheets of oil paper to make their jackets more waterproof, or telling those on the home front to warm up thin blankets by, layering, by laying old newspaper sheets between the layers of fabric. This framing of paper as an at-hand, all-purpose stand-in for and solution to the strains of wartime rationing was also pitched to businesses through trade exhibitions displaying the latest developments in Erzatz products. The Deutsche Faserstoff Ausstellung, for instance, featured displays on paper fabrics and traveled to major cities throughout Germany, including Berlin, Dusseldorf, and Leipzig in 1918. The Erzatzmittelausstellung in Vienna similarly featured an affiliated exhibition of such paper textiles. Its promotional poster, designed by the Hungarian illustrator Mihaly Biro, depicts the god Mercury cradling a, roll, a large roll of paper that has started to unfurl at one end. The paper frays into strips from which float finished shirts, pants, dresses, and rope ready-made. As the scholar Maria Michaela has shown, demand for cloth was particularly acute. 
due to serious shortages of the necessary raw materials for textile production, such as cotton, flax, and wool, papers of various thicknesses and types became an ersatz for leather, linen, canvas, cotton, and hemp, producing paper yarn, textiles, rope, upholstery, fake leather for shoes and belts, rugs, and other related commodities. Paper was thus promoted as a protein material that could fill many functions. The actual experiences of individuals with paper substitutes, however, were more likely to take less transubstantiated forms. For example, ration cards, pieces of paper exchangeable for set weights of flour, butter, sugar, eggs, or certificates for clothing and shoes, called bazookshina, were a much more common stand-in for unavailable consumer goods. The most significant, visible, and terrifying form of paper ersatz during the war and in the years immediately following was paper money. Paper currency proliferated during the war in part because paper largely replaced coins, which were hoarded due to the rising price of metal and to keep pace with ever-rising inflation. This fed a vicious cycle and the failure of paper money to retain value, in part due to its lack of material value, required the printing of more and more of it, substituting value with volume. Germans were thus primed to associate scarcity and its inadequate paper substitutes, scarcity with these inadequate paper substitutes, and were more likely to see paper and its products as an inferior and ultimately disposable form of ersatz. But what effect did such material changes and conceptual shifts in the relationship to paper have on artistic practice? In order to consider this broad question, I want to look at two focused cases that confront the material implications of these changes on one hand and the more conceptual provocations they presented on the other. The first involves research conducted with colleagues in conservation at LACMA in connection with an exhibition project. The second considers one artist's very unique approach to handling paper during this period, that of Kirchfitters. As part of the research, for our exhibition, Pressing Politics, Revolutionary Graphics from Mexico and Germany, my curatorial colleague Rachel Kaplan and I wanted to better understand the types of papers used as supports for the many printed materials produced in Mexico and Germany during and after the revolutionary periods covered by our exhibition. We took the opportunity afforded by a paper project grant from the Getty Trust to collaborate with Madison Brockman, assistant paper conservator in LACMA's paper conservation department. Madison, in turn, was assisted by Laura Maccarelli, associate conservation scientist, and Yosi Pozolov, senior photographer and imaging specialist. Madison took samples from a selected set of prints representing a cross-section of works in the exhibition. Through visual and microscopic examination, X-ray fluorescence, microfade testing, and fiber identification through polarizing light microscopy, Madison was able to identify characteristic components of the pigments used in the printing inks, the fiber and filler content of the paper supports, and the manufacturing techniques used to produce those supports. Overall, Madison's findings both confirmed suspicions and offered intriguing specifics that demand further research. Wood pulp was found across the papers tested. As expected, it was present in papers that were obviously aged newsprint, but also, surprisingly, both bleached and unbleached wood pulp appeared in prints produced for the market. Even a branded art paper, such as the Gemund Dreikunige paper, used for George Gross's World Made Safe for Democracy, was made from a mix of fibers, including wood pulp. Most of the pulp in these papers was bleached wood pulp, though one sheet, the title page for Wilhelm Plunica's Portfolio de Marseillaise, was made entirely from unbleached or mechanically processed wood pulp. Because of the underprocessing of the pulp fibers, the paper had high levels of lignin, which accounts for its brittle character and yellowed appearance. And I don't know if you can see this in the detail, but um, the, the kind of uh, close-up um, magnification of the paper, you can kind of see some of these um, unprocessed pieces of shive, they're called, um, in the detail at right, which is from the print um, in the center. The most surprising findings came from Carl Schmidt Rotloff's Christus. The paper on which it was printed contained a significant amount of wool fiber. Wool is not used to make modern rag papers and is rarely intentionally found in any kind of paper, so the result was unexpected. We can only speculate on the why of this paper's unusual composition. Understanding if, why, and how paper manufacturers change their products demands further research. These discoveries do have important immediate implications, however, for the care and 
of these prints in the medium and long term. We learned that these papers had varying levels of light sensitivity, which has consequences for their conservation and care. But the findings also have implications for art historians and suggest that there is more work to be done to understand the transformations in modern paper manufacturing and its effect on art production. Such changes are not exclusive to German papers or this particular period, as other presentations during the symposium, such as Michelle Foas and Emanuel Hinslens, have suggested. Understanding the paper universe that Jan Scheschold invokes is important because so many new and different varieties of paper were being used in new and expansive ways, not only by producers and consumers, but also by artists. And this was never more true than with the artist Kurt Schwitters. Schwitters certainly had a special sensitivity to materials and an almost alchemical talent for transcending them. No artist, I think, recognized so well the promise of paper's transformative potential. For Schwitters, paper was the medium of his Merz drawings as much as the support. The papers he often used were not specialty products, but salvaged throwaways, printed train tickets, ration cards, and scraps of old money, the kinds of paper objects, in other words, that rarely break the surface of one's awareness beyond their immediate function, let alone demand any sustained visual attention. The art historian and longtime friend of the artist, Carola Gideon Velker, wrote of his works that, quote, much of the period, much of the atmosphere of Germany at the time resonates in them. One senses the years of inflation in which banknotes were devalued hourly and pile up into senseless rubbish. And it was also the time of hunger strikes, mass revolts, and social revolutions in Germany. Kurt Schwitters creates a symbolic expression for this very atmosphere. He does not describe, he does not narrate, he suggests a general climate." End quote. Hyperflation was part of this climate, a monstrous moment of paper made visible the material forcing itself into view in a way that was disturbing or threatening. Paper money during hyperinflation is akin to Michael Thompson's notion of rubbish, a concept distinct from trash, which is more or less invisible because it remains below the level of conscious awareness. Quote, we only notice rubbish when it is in the wrong place, end quote. Rubbish is material that has forced its way into view, something that we see but would rather ignore. But rubbish can also be recovered, reevaluated, and in the process revalued. Kurt Schwitter's special talent for, remaking, for making paper visible represents a more utopian or affirmative alternative to rubbish, pulling pieces out of the stream of waste paper and making something new of them. Schwitter's strategy has connections to Bill Brown's concept of misuse value, which Brown describes as, quote, the aspects of an object, sensuous, aesthetic, semiotic, that become palpable, legible, audible when the object is experienced in whatever time it takes for an object to become another thing, end quote. This transformation from object to thing might result in what he calls the fetishistic sorry, overvaluation or unreasonable objectification of the object that dislodges it from the circuits through which it is what it typically is, end quote. Inside of a Schwitter's Merit's drawing, one recognizes these objects not as money or train tickets or ration cards or candy wrappers. Rather, one attends to the delicate tracery on the border of the coal card played off against the transparency and fragility of tissue paper in his MZ-13. On the left, you can kind of see the colon cart up at the top. Or the charming graphic design of Hanover's potato ration coupons validated with what looks like a flower stamp in Merz set 19. And so you see those um, potato stamps kind of here at the bottom. These are combined with many other kinds of papers, mixing patterns, haptic textures, and tones so that one is constantly observing them in relation, attending to their color, weight, and size. In Schwitter's Merritt's drawings, paper sticks, folds, tears, frays, covers, layers, and fades. It also changes with time. Schwitter's invites what Brown calls, quote, unreasonable objectification, turning devalued paper objects into things to be considered and prized. Schwitter's work is distinct from that of his Dada colleagues, who, by comparison, often employ paper as incidental to the content printed on it. The words and visual fragments take precedence over and make meaning independent of their material support. Money, in particular, when used as art material, underscores this distinction. In collages by Raoul Hausmann and George Gross, money, in whole or as a fragment, is collaged into the composition. It nevertheless signifies as money or signifies in relation to it a shiv in the neck of Hausmann's art critic, or collected amongst the assortment of objects in front of Gross's brilliant profiteer. In Schwitter's untitled Merz work, by comparison, the number on the piece of the Notgeld, 100,000, 
100,000 sign signals a later moment of inflation, but neither the fragment nor the work is about money or its relative worthlessness. Rather, Schwitters uses the interminable length of the denomination on the note, a long, lean line of letters, as a compositional device dividing the work roughly in half. He has also altered the note so it is not immediately apparent that it is, or was, money. Discussion of Schwitter's use of materials often defaults to language that art history has codified for other media. Isabel Schultz, for example, discusses Schwitter's work, Merritt's works as painterly. This has as much to do with the discipline's relative difficulty describing distinctive practices as it does with the success with which Schwitter's pulls them off. I would consider a different word for these early Merritt's drawings, paperly. That is, although Schwitter's uses a range of materials, it is paper, I think, that is doing the most work and that pulls off the largest range of effects. A material that is both hard and soft, thick and thin, textured and smooth, dark and light. Paper, promoted as a protein material during the war, was an ersatz failure, but Schwitter's papers celebrate the transformative possibilities of the material in the right hands. Leah Dickerman has suggested Schwitter's merits practice in relation to Leo Steinberg's description of the move from the vertical alignment of the canvas to the horizontal register of the flatbread press, a move from nature to culture, from the illusionistic window to the random accumulation and scattering of debris on a surface. This analogy is appropriate not only because the horizontal, service, like Schwitter's, horizontal surface, like Schwitter's, collects castoffs, but also because printed material plays such an important role in Schwitter's practice overall. Schwitters, however, is ultimately less interested in printmaking as such. He is interested, instead, in printed paper. This is seen in some of his most successful prints, prints published in the last year of hyperinflation, which are ultimately about printed paper, or more specifically, printing mistakes and rejects. Schwitters Merits III, Portfolio of Six Lithographs, quote, Gemerzt on the Stone, as the title page notes, appear at first like a catalog of mistakes and mishaps, sheets that should not see the light of day. On closer inspection, most of the elements Schwitters has gemerzt into these compositions are the marginal marks or elements that remain invisible in a finished professionally printed commercial product, the trim lines, center marks, and checkerboard grids for printer test pages. Schwitters assembled the pieces for this portfolio from rejected materials scrounged from the mulling plant, a commercial printer in Hanover. Such signs were typically seen only by the printer, but Schwitter centers these secret symbols, exposing the seams of the seemingly flawless products of paper culture and making visible a process that required the constant production and disposal of excess paper to maintain the illusion of perfection. Kata Steinitz, Schwitter's friend and sometimes collaborator, wrote in her memoir about an incident at the mulling plant in which Schwitter's, who liked to spend time in the plant's basement, was sifting through, quote, all the rubbish and waste paper sent down via chute from the floors above. Quote, he couldn't use what the mulling plant turned out as finished illustrations for other people, she notes. Quote, he thought they were awful, but he sorted out the unfinished pages that appealed to him as carefully as a connoisseur, as carefully as a connoisseur would have examined the precious prints in a museum collection, end quote. One day, she recounts, Schwitters happened to be standing under the chute, quote, the ceiling suddenly opened and a mountain of paper came down. I watched as the avalanche hit Kurt Schwitters, threatening to bury him alive. He stood bent over, defending himself against the onslaught. Then raising his head, he stood up in the midst of the rubbish, a new gargantua, twisting and dancing in the world of papers. In both arms, he held paper, paper, paper. Around his feet, lumps, scraps, and buckets of waste paper swirled. Kurt Schwitters groaned and laughed. Finally, he emerged alive." End quote. This potentially threatening inundation becomes a baptism by paper, a dramatic demonstration of the ways that Schwitter's creativity thrived on the unprecedented volume and variety of waste paper generated by modern culture for the paper universe, compelling him to create something unique and invaluable, merits out of the mass-produced refuse. Thank you. <laughs>